Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those joining us from the West Coast. My name is Hamara Osman, and on behalf of Muscular Dystrophy Canada, I'm very happy to welcome you to our webinar for our new Let's Talk NMD, Let's Talk Neuromuscular Disorder series. Before I introduce today's topic, I would like to mention that we have muted all participants, but I welcome you to type any questions or comments throughout today's session in the chat box. We have a lot of time at the end of today's webinar for a live Q&A. Please note, a recording of today's webinar will be available at, by the end of the week on our MDC YouTube channel. With that said, let's get started. Today's weekly webinar is on myasthenia gravis. This is a very timely webinar as June is Myasthenia Gravis Awareness Month in Canada, which is dedicated to increasing awareness of MG, supporting those living with myasthenia gravis, and creating connections for the myasthenia community, gravis community in Canada. Although Muscular Dystrophy Canada represents over 160 different neuromuscular disorders, we recognize the unique needs and rich lived experiences of individuals living with MG and their family members. We aim to develop education materials, information and networking opportunities for the MG community in Canada, and to continue to provide supports for clinical and translational research for myasthenia gravis. We are very grateful for our terrific lineup of speakers, today um, that will be able to share trusted and evidence-based information on myasthenia gravis. In advance of their presentations, I would like to thank each of our speakers for their time and expertise. First, we have Dr. Zaim Siddiqui. Dr. Siddiqui is a professor of medicine and neurology at the University of Alberta and a director of the neuromuscular program. Dr. Siddiqui did his neurology residency and fellowship training at Duke University in the US he is involved in translational and clinical research in myasthenia gravis and has been the lead investigator in several national and international clinical trials. His work has optimized the use of aminoglobulin therapy in neuromuscular diseases in the rural regions of northern Alberta and neighboring provinces. He established a state-of-the-art autonomic laboratory through a grant from the Canadian Foundation for Innovation. Welcome, Dr. Siddiqui. Thank you. Can you hear me, Claire? Yes, you can go ahead and share screen now. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you for the nice introduction. I'll be talking about my senior gravis and basically will be yeah, my objects for today. I'll be giving you a brief uh, introduction about the disease itself how we end up diagnosing it. But a major portion of my talk would be giving you something what is happening in this field, uh, in the field of translational research as well as newer treatments that are coming around. Myasthenia is a relatively uncommon disease. It has a low prevalence, but uh, recent literature shows that the incidence may be increasing in the elderly though it's possible that this may be due to better diagnosis. It is an autoimmune disease, meaning that your own body produces antibodies that attack the proteins at the junction between the nerve and muscle called the neuromuscular junction. These antibodies are directed against specific proteins, most commonly against the acetylcholine receptor. We'll talk about that in a second. Other antibodies which have been found to attack the, another uh, neuromuscular junction protein, the muscle-specific tyrosine kinase, and then some rare forms, the anti-lipoprotein-4, and recently more, another antibody, Agrin. So these are some of the antibodies uh, that have been uh, shown uh, to produce the disease in these patients. Basically, in a normal uh, neuromuscular junction, on the left over here, you see a normal neuromuscular junction. This is a nerve terminal. It synapses or makes a junction with the muscle, with the muscle membrane, and there's a gap which is called the synaptic cleft. As the nerve impulse or the signal comes down the nerve terminal, it releases acetylcholine. The acetylcholine then binds to the membrane of the muscle at specific areas where the receptors are. So the muscle membrane has got these folds, and these folds at their peaks have got these specific receptors for the acetylcholine. And as this binding takes place, there's electrical current generated in the muscle 
and the muscle contracts. So it's an electrical signal which converts into a chemical signal in the shape of acetylcholine, which again generates an electrical current in the muscle and the muscle contracts. In contrast to you know, muscular junction, the antibodies attack these receptors, the acetylcholine receptors mainly, but some other protein as well, as I've mentioned the anti-musk antibodies. This antigen antibody reaction makes this muscle junction membrane become very simplified. You can see the depths of the folds have been simplified. The muscle, the receptors are, have reduced density over here. So overall, the receptor density is reduced. And as the current comes down the terminal, release the acetylcholine, there's not enough receptor for the acetylcholine to work. And hence the current generated is very small. So this electrochemical electrical transmission is affected in patient myasthenia. And as more and more current comes down, the acetylcholine does not find it, its receptors. It hangs around in the junction and then gets uh, uh, hydrolyzed or digested. So there's not enough current generated, the muscle gets fatigued. So myasthenia disease itself has a biomodal distribution. What that means is it's more common in females at younger age. And as the age progresses in older population, it's more commonly seen in males. Most of you who suffer from the disease will recognize these symptoms. The hallmark of myasthenia is weakness, muscle weakness. And the typical feature of this muscle weakness is that it's fluctuating and fatigable. What that means is the weakness is different day to day and also within a day. For example, it's the weakness is better in the morning. The patient will tell you that they feel much stronger in the morning and by the afternoon or late evening, they start feeling tired, fatigued and weak. This is called fluctuating weakness. And I'll show you a demonstration of that as well and a fatigable weakness. Most common symptoms the patient presents are double vision and droopy eyelids. Their eyeballs are misaligned and you can see that on the physical exam. Other muscle that involves facial weakness is quite common. Their smile changes, their voice changes, they become hoarse or nasal voice. They have difficulty chewing and swallowing. They can choke on the food. Any combination of neck muscle weakness with a head drop, breathing difficulties, limb muscle weakness, particularly muscle with a attached to the trunk, meaning the shoulder and hip muscles, getting up from a chair or squatting and getting up, they become more uh, effortful. They require more effort and the patient ties in these muscles. So we see myasthenia, it's a heterogeneous disease and it can come in any shape and form, any combination of the muscles, but the most common muscles involved are the ones which affect the eyes. It's, in, it's useful to classify myasthenia because it does affect the management and the disease course. Uh, typically, we divide myasthenia in, into ocular and generalized, meaning if it's restricted to the ocular muscle, the eye muscle, the droopy eye, double vision is called ocular versus generalized. Age of onset is important. Uh, we treat myasthenia differently in gender, particularly in children versus adults and elderly. There are different treatment uh, we use in different age groups. Thymic involvement is critical. We all patients diagnosed with myasthenia get a chest CT to make sure they don't have a thymoma. If they have one, no matter what the age is, it needs to be resected. Typically, we don't offer thymectomy to patients above 60, uh, barring if they have a thymoma, which would need resection at any age, if there are no surgical contraindication. Serological status, meaning the type of antibody they have, it has a huge implication uh, for the treatment. Certain forms of myasthenia do respond better to certain, uh, certain medications, though this is not uh, very clear what determines their response to treatment. And then MGFA, the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America classification, it's useful for research as well as it's sort of a universal language. We speak to experts. If somebody mentions to me that the patient has a class three, B myasthenia, I would know exactly what the patient has as compared to somebody who got class one A myasthenia, class one myasthenia, sorry. How we diagnose myasthenia? Uh, that's uh, uh, typically, it's the clinical suspicion. If uh, typically in North America, the literature shows the delay diagnosis of myasthenia is about two years. 
So the most, the biggest hurdle people say is having a clinical suspicion because my senior symptoms can mimic a number of diseases. Uh, many times it's not thought of. Once you suspect my senior, the diagnosis becomes relatively easier. Bedside examination is critical. Uh, we used to do in the past a tensile test, giving a chemical and seeing how the patient responds. That is not uh, done as much nowadays in North America. We do use the ice pack test many times. Uh, you'll go in a clinic initially and your physician may have applied an ice pack to your eye to see if your droopy eyelid improves or by just closing your eyes for a minute or two and see if the weakness improves. That suggests if it does, it does suggest that the patient may have myasthenia. And then we do lab testing, which includes electrophysiology and serological testing. We'll show it to you in a second. Here's a clinical examination feature of myasthenia, which is hallmark. You can see this gentleman looking upwards. The eyeballs are misaligned. This eyeball is looking up and to the left. This patient would have double vision uh, looking up, but also the left eyelid is droopy over here. As the patient continues to look up over time, was about a minute or so, you can see the eyelid completely shuts down. Not only that, the eyeball also, you can see the eyeball has moved a little outward as well. So this is fatiguing. This is a hallmark of myasthenia, classical feature of fatigable weakness, which we try to look for in the clinical exam. Testing for myasthenia, electrophysiology, many of you may have had it. Uh, this is what it shows fatigue. This is a normal muscle. When the nerve is stimulated, the muscle responds and you can see the response remains constant with a 10, 10 uh, stimuli. But in patients with myasthenia, as you continue to stimulate the nerve, the muscle response becomes fatigued, the amplitude becomes, and this is a hallmark, it's called a decrement response, a decremental response, where the initial amplitude becomes lower as with um, the muscle fatigues, because I told you the pathophysiology, the acetylcholine attaching to the receptors in myasthenia, this effect, this is affected and the muscle show this signs of fatigue. This is the electrical counterpart of muscle fatigue. And finally, if uh, that doesn't, we do sometimes single fiber EMG in which a needle is uh, put into a muscle and it's electrical activity recorded. In a normal patient uh, with the normal transmission, you can see a nerve uh, fiber recording. This is, uh, these are two fibers supplied by the same nerve fiber. So these two muscle fibers are time locked to each other and when they do fire, they fire together. In my senior, as compared, you see this horizontal uh, splay of the, this is a delay of uh, current transmission. As one fires, the other one sometimes fires early, sometimes late, and this is a hallmark of a neuromuscular transmission disorder. In severe cases, sometimes the first one fires, the second one does not fire. This is called blocking. And this is, uh, suggests a more severe uh, affliction of the neuromuscular junction. And we, this is not specific for myasthenia, though in a right clinical setting, this is the most sensitive test we have for myasthenia for diagnosis of myasthenia in patients who other tests are negative. And finally, we go to serology, blood tests. These take some time to, uh, the results take some time. In Alberta, sometimes we have to wait for two to three weeks for these to come back. Uh, in generalized myasthenia, as I mentioned to you, the most common antibody is anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody. About 80% of patients have that. As compared to ocular myasthenia, about 50% have acetylcholine receptor antibody. Rare form the anti-musk, which these two antibodies are available in Canada. Anti-LRP4 is just beginning. They have just developed some uh, assays and hopefully should be more widespread available, widely available in the next uh, several months. And as you can see, these are much rare antibodies, anti-LRP4. And then there's a sizable number, about 5 to 10% of patients who do not uh, show any antibodies. And these are called seronegative. And that's where the single fiber EMG is very important because these patients, despite being seronegative, will show abnormalities on this test. So again, in ocular myasthenia, diagnosis is a little bit more difficult because fewer have antibodies. They've got a higher proportion of patients who are seronegative. In these patients particularly, the diagnosis can be a challenging and that's where the electrical testing comes in. So we talked about antibodies. Now antibodies in myasthenia are sort of a biomarker. And what is a biomarker? Biomarkers are entities and they're extremely useful in, in, in our field. These are entities that we can objectively quantify. For example, in diabetes, the sugar levels. A patient, the doctor does not even have to see a patient. They can by sugar levels tell 
how the diabetes have done over the last three months, how the medication are working. So biomarkers objectively, they can be measured objectively, quantitatively, they indicate the disease itself, how active the disease is, how it's responding to treatment, and if whether it's the patient having any adverse effects. There are a number of biomarkers available for various diseases. These range from genetic uh, biomarkers, histology, serums in the blood. You can have proteins, inflammatory markers, MRI findings, for example, in MS, MRI, the physicians do MRI every year to see how the disease is progressing. And these are biomarkers. So the biomarkers can be diagnostics, for example, in the antibodies I showed you, the uh, diagnostic biomarkers in my senior, prognostic biomarkers, which tell you when the patient walks in your clinic, if you had a biomarker, that would tell how the disease would do in the long run, how important that would be. And then predictive biomarkers. Uh, some biomarkers can, can, can tell how the patient responds to therapy or is. In my senior, unfortunately, we don't have strong biomarkers. Apart from the diagnostic biomarkers, these antibodies do not correlate with disease severity. They don't tell us whether, the, for example, a patient with estyle colon receptor antibody, very high levels, may have a very mild disease as compared to low levels with a very severe. So they don't predict the course. They don't predict the response to therapy. And so the current research is focused on finding novel biomarkers. I've been involved in that and for many years, for the last five to seven years, that has been a top priority among research community in my senior to find robust biomarkers. And this is something where the field is going these days. There are a number of centers. There is a, there's a network about eight centers in North America, which is collecting samples to see if they can find biomarkers in my senior. As far as the treatment is concerned, I'll spend just a minute or two on this. It won't take too long. Yeah, just to let you know that my MG, as you know, is a heterogeneous disease. No two patients are the same. About 85% respond very well to treatments that we have. About 15% are refractory and have, uh, you know, and have us quite significantly affected. There are a number of factors we look in managing myasthenia. When a patient walks in, we look at the age, we look at how bad the disease is, how severe the symptoms are, how soon we need to control the symptoms. If the patient has got respiratory issues, we will bring the patient to the hospital as compared to ocular myasthenia, you might treat it as an outpatient. Again, comorbidities play a huge role in managing myasthenia. For example, diabetes precludes, we try to avoid steroids in diabetes. Other autoimmune diseases, I've got about 5% of patients have got rheumatoid arthritis. And we see, we try to see if both diseases can be managed with one, one immune suppressive therapy and so on and so forth. So myasthenic management is quite variable from patient to patient. In general, uh, we start with symptomatic treatment with mesterone and then move on to stronger agents such as immunosuppression with prednisone, azathioprine in combination. And in certain cases, we offer thymectomy. Plasmapheresis and IVIG is reserved for more severe cases. And what I want to highlight is just in the last couple of slides, how the management has changed in my senior. So just about 10 years back, this was, this is a major publication in neurology. And you can see the first, second, third, and fourth line agents. This the first line agent, pyrostigmine, prednisone, thymectomy may remain the same, but second and third line agents are changing rapidly. And, and typically in July, my senior, we start with a style called symptomatic treatment alone. And if they're thymoma, we send for thymectomy. And after that, if the patient does not respond, we add prednisone and or imidran sequentially or together and wait for about a year or so. If it responds, we try to lower the prednisone and if that does not respond, we add another, we switch the therapy into another agent. Uh, and this, by this time, we know the patient is refractory. And what has changed in the last few years is this, is the, there are new therapies which are coming, the monoclonal antibodies. These are targeted therapies, uh, which are specifically directed against a particular part of the immune, uh, immune response. The Tuximab is commonly used. We employ it regularly in our, you know, it's our second or third line agent now, very frequently. And more lately, and this is my last slide, this is what the most exciting part is. Just in the last couple of years, there are a number of new medications that have come around. The Regan trial showing eclizumab to be highly effective in resistant myasthenia. Uh, Zilucropan, which came in the last one year. And just last two weeks ago, you can see a DAP trial came out positive. So these are newer monoclonal antibodies with novel mechanisms of actions, which are very highly effective. So in the last, next five to 10 years, I expect the landscape of treatment to be changed in myasthenia with more targeted 
more targeted and novel therapies. I think I'll stop over here and let my other uh, panel members, uh, we can take the questions afterwards when we finish these talks. Thank you so much. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Siddiqui. Next, we have Dr. Angela Genge. Dr. Genge completed her medical degree at the Memorial University of Newfoundland. She joined the staff of the Montreal Neurological Hospital in 1994 and became the director of the ALS Clinic in 1998. Dr. Genge's involvement in clinical research began while she was a resident in neurology, assisting in early trials in both multiple sclerosis and neural aids. Her clinical and research interests are neuromuscular disorders such as ALS, myopathies, neuropathies, myasthenia gravis, and pain. Dr. Genge is currently a neurologist and the director of the clinical research unit at the Neuro in Montreal. Welcome, Dr. Genge. I believe you can go ahead and share screen right now. Hello, everyone. Do you see my screen? Yes. Can you actually put it in a full screen mode, Dr. Genge? That's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Um, let's see. We'll just do it. Does that do it? No, I believe this might be right now in a presenter view. Um, Greg is mentioning to ch uh, click display settings right there up top on the center where it says, yep. Yeah. Mm, let me see. Still not, ah, oh, here we go, sorry. Excellent, thank you so much, Dr. Kent. Okay, folks, so um, thank you for the introduction. The, I'm going to lead on with a couple of comments on the impact of myasthenia on uh, a patient's, a person's quality of life, uh, because patients are people and the effect of, of this disease can be quite profound and uh, not easy to, uh, to communicate to regulatory authorities that are looking at um, at whether or not to approve a new drug for this disease. It is certainly, as uh, Dr. Siddiqui has just mentioned, it is certainly a new era, and we all dream of the day when patients no longer require prednisone or chronic IVIG or plasmapheresis to maintain a, a certain quality of life. So I wanna talk about a couple things that we know. We know um, that, um, patients who have had um, have what we call refractory myasthenia, which is the group that we're currently targeting with some of these newer medications, um, have a history of having uh, tried many medications in the past. And uh, those of you who have a more refractory myasthenia can relate to the fact that it usually um, means that uh, you have much more frequent visits to your doctor, to the emergency room, and even um, to um, being admitted to the hospital. When it was looked at as what uh, is affected when you have a refractory myasthenia, a number of things have been identified as critical. And for those of you who, who have these symptoms, you can appreciate how much that impacts your ability to function normally, everything from your normal activities of daily living, like dressing, eating, and swallowing, and reading, to the ability to work. And as you can see, these symptoms um, are very common symptoms, uh, common tasks like combing your hair, brushing your teeth. At least half of the patients who have refractory myasthenia have problems doing something as simple as brushing their teeth or getting out of a chair. The impact it can be documented in terms of percentages and a one small study looked at a group of patients who uh, were defined as having refractory myasthenia. And as you can see, two thirds of people had a very negative effect of myasthenia on their ability to work. And almost two thirds of the patients um, were having to adjust their normal activities uh, to compensate for the symptoms of myasthenia. 
that Dr. Siddiqui just described. Certainly the frustration level of a disease which prevents you from uh, normal activities is quite high. Again, um, documented as at least two thirds of patients felt this was quite significant. Why is this important? It's important uh, because when we uh, look at new therapies and we talk to people who are, um, who are pivotal in deciding whether or not patients in Canada get access to these drugs, we have to be able to describe the benefit of treating the disease better. And if you look simply at uh, the ability to work, the more severe your myasthenia, the more likely it directly affects your ability to, to work and eventually um, will affect your ability to return to work if the treatments are not effective early on. So although many of our new drugs you'll see are targeted towards people with refractory myasthenia, we will, once some of these new therapies are available to Canadians, we'll for sure be looking at how we can use them earlier in the disease to actually prevent people from becoming refractory. But for now, that's the, the group of patients we're looking at. Uh, those, those of you who require um, multiple medications or require medications on a very regular basis to keep yourself functional. So let me talk briefly about uh, a number of very exciting programs. Um, and um, I would say this is a sea change. The, the first thing that has happened, which is already past the clinical trial phase, is ecolizumab, which um, Dr. Zidiki mentioned was the REGAIN study. And it has been, had been approved for other serious neurolo um, immunological diseases and was then uh, found to be effective for uh, refractory myasthenia and for another condition, uh, which is a type of multiple sclerosis. So with the uh, approval of ecolizumab for uh, myasthenia, it's really opened up how we look at treatments for myasthenia. So there's a company called Raw Pharma which is now uh, joined with another company called UCB. And they've developed an, a drug that targets the same um, part of the immune system, something we call C5, um, but targets it differently than Solaris or Ecolizumab. And this study is now open for new patients who have refractory myasthenia. I should say at the outset, that all of these studies are being offered in more than one place in Canada. Uh, we at the Neuro, at the Montreal Neurological Hospital, uh, offer several of these trials and other places across Canada also offer some of these trials. So the whole country does not have to fly to Montreal. You need to just find your local um, clinic uh, where some of these trials are being, being performed. Zilicoplan, is the drug from Raw Pharma. And it in fact is um, not an IV, but in fact a subcutaneous injection. And this one is actually not a monoclonal antibody. It's actually a small molecule. So you give yourself daily a, an injection similar to the way patients give themselves insulin. And this drug has, is now being looked at as a permanent treatment for myasthenia gravis. The patients who, who want to go into this trial have to be a certain age, 18 to 75. They have to have refractory myasthenia gravis, at least generalized myasthenia. They have to either have had a positive acetylcholine receptor antibody test or they don't know their, their, uh, which antibody they have. Either one, you can still be screened for the study. The, um, there are certain scores we looked at on your examination, both at baseline, which means when you, when you get ready to start the drug, and at screening, which is when we determine whether or not you're eligible for the trial. There are a couple exceptions. You, if you've used Solaris in the past, um, you are not eligible to try this, uh, this medication. And as long as your thymectomy was at least a year prior to us being screened for this trial, you're still eligible. So it's a 
three months trial. And once a trial is done, there's something called an open label extension, which means that you can use, you can have the real drug as long as the open label extension exists. And if you are in this trial, if you have a worsening of your myasthenia, um, you can use some of the more traditional treatments to, um, to treat your myasthenia exacerbation. I should note that, that patients who are in clinical trials do not pay for the drug. The drug is free. That's part of the obligation to the company that they provide the drug and they provide things like parking or transportation in order to allow patients to go in and try these new therapies. The phase two results from this drug were actually quite impressive, which has led to this new trial. And it showed some uh, a impressive decrease in, in some of the important things like the QMG score. They also showed significant improvement in myasthenia activities of daily living and quality of life scores. And in fact, they were able to do, uh, document um, and as Dr. Siddiqui mentioned, we're looking for biomarkers. In this case, a biomarker is in the complement system and they were able to prove that they had a direct effect on the complement. So pretty exciting stuff. The phase two results are public, which is why we've gone on to the phase three. In clinical trials, once you finish a phase three, if you continue to show that the drug is working for myasthenia and has no uh, side effects, that are difficult for the patient, then the next step is taking the drug to Health Canada, getting it approved and ha having access for all Canadians. Of course, the open label extension is also a, a recognition by the company and the sites that patients who participate should have access to the, to the drug until they can get access to it from their local pharmacy. That can sometimes take years. So patients get free drug for a long period of time if they enter one of these types of trials. The second um, phase three trial um, for myasthenia that we have running right now has a, is a, from another company called UCB. This drug actually targets something different. It targets something called the FCRN receptor and it is, uh, this one is a monoclonal antibody. I can barely pronounce the name. So Rosenelixuzumab. So as you can imagine, there is a nickname for it. Um, but this is, you give it to yourself once a week. So it's a subcutaneous injection, again, like insulin, and you give it to yourself once a week. It had very good phase two results. And you'll see that a lot, if you look at this slide, you see a lot of the criteria. You have to be over 18. You have to have active myasthenia. You have to have positive antibodies for this one, but you can have musk antibodies as well. It's not just for patients with acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Again, you cannot be on Solaris, but in this case, you can have had Solaris in the past. And, um, Certain other things like no thumbectomy recently are important. The phase two results showed a significant responder rate, both with the uh, QMG score and the Mycenae Gravis activity of daily living. And they showed, a, again, a significant drop of what they feel was the bad protein, the IgG levels. And so that has led to this now really important phase three study. Dr. Um, Zidiki also mentioned Arginex. So Arginex, in fact, produced this, uh, this monoclonal antibody, um, again, to the FCRN receptor. And the results just came out a couple weeks ago, uh, as he mentioned, and showed at least a two-point improvement in the Mycenae Gravis activities of daily living for at least four consecutive weeks. If you have refractory myasthenia. This actually is a very significant result. When you combine that with the fact that this is an antibody um, that you can give in a cycle and that the treatment, which is intravenous, uh, can be given at a different infusion rate depending on your response to the therapy, you have a very important new way of treating myasthenia. 
In fact, with this, you have um, what we will now have to do is wait and see when they will be considering bringing this uh, treatment to Canada um, and so that Canadian patients can have access. I have to stress that the time it takes to get a drug to your local pharmacy or infusion center from when you get results like this can actually be quite long. It can be two to three years, um, even in a best case scenario. So what that means is if you're really having uh, struggles and your myasthenia is not under good control and you are willing to come to a, a clinic either in Alberta or Ontario or Quebec where we're treating um, patients in these clinical trials, uh, you will have access to some of these new therapies much more quickly than if you wait for them to be approved and available at your local infusion center. So with that, I'm going to hand this off to, I believe, our next speaker. Um, but it's my pleasure to answer any questions at the end of this talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Genge. Next, we have Dr. Uh, Hans Katzberg. Dr. Katzberg is a neurologist at the Prozerman Center for Neuromuscular Diseases at the Toronto General Hospital University Health Network, and he's a clinical investigator at Kremble Brain Institute here in Toronto. He's an associate professor of uh, medicine and neurology at the University of Toronto, where he also serves as a fellowship program director for neurology since 2012. Dr. Katzberg has previously served as research co-chair for the Canadian Association of Neuromuscular Diseases, CAN, and MD from 2012 to 2017, and associate editor for the Canadian Journal of Neurological Sciences from 2013 to 2018. Dr. Katzberg's research interests include the assessment and treatment of neuropathies and neuromuscular junction disorders, such as myasthenia gravis. Welcome, Dr. Katzberg. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, sounds great. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. So very happy to share some insights today on the disease course, how myasthenia gravis progresses, fatigue, breathing, sleep, and sleepiness, and you'll see how these interact shortly. Here are my uh, disclosures. It does include, uh, I will talk about a grant that I received from Muscular Dystrophy Canada to address some of these topics as well as a relevant disclosure. So here are the three questions. What is the usual course of myasthenia gravis? What is the relationship between fatigue, sleepiness, and sleep in myasthenia? And what are the respiratory assessments? So first, uh, some of the types of MG, because this does um, have an impact on how the disease is going to progress. And I'm very thankful for Dr. Siddiqui for doing the intro where a lot of these topics have already been raised. Firstly, it's important to note that there is also genetic as well as acquired uh, forms of myasthenia, and acquired often being an alteration of the immune system, uh, which has an impact on disease course because acquired MG is more often associated uh, with sharp changes, which can be worsening, including episodes of what uh, we call crisis, where there can be a challenge with breathing uh, in the acute phase, and also spontaneous improvements as well. And this goes to the concept Dr. Siddiqui said about fluctuations. There are also patients, uh, as Dr. Siddiqui mentioned, that have myasthenia restricted to the eyes. And this can also be severe, but in general tends to be less um, severe uh, than generalized myasthenia because it only affects the eye muscles and does not include some of the other muscles Dr. Siddiqui mentioned, the breathing muscles, the swallowing muscles, and the limb and axial muscles in the spine. Uh, before I go into the majority of the case, it's important to note what are some of the outliers. So there are patients uh, with refractory myasthenia. These are patients that despite multiple types of treatments that we uh, intervene with and repeatedly uh, may still experience significant deficits. There's also the other extreme where there is benign MG, patients who have little to no symptoms without trying, even trying any medication. So these groups are do exist, but it's not uh, as common as the bulk of patients, which often do require treatments. Uh, here is on the left, you'll see a graph on mortality in myasthenia, starting from the beginning of the century, where really this condition was a, a quite a grave condition, leading to the name myasthenia gravis. But as you can see, over the years and over the decades, with improvements in technology, 
supportive treatments, intensive care units, as well as uh, a number of the immune treatments that really started around the 60s and 70s leading up till to now, really uh, helped tailor the treatments and make uh, MG more manageable. And as you can see, there's even more treatments now that will change the landscape even further. So really any um, uh, prognosis and disease course that we know will certainly be altered over the next a few decades since uh, in the positive uh, uh, because we'll be able to get a bit more of a specific control of these medications. But just a few comments um, just in general about disease course. Firstly, MG is a chronic disease. So although there is periods of remission, so any patient uh, can go into a remission without, with no symptoms or little to no symptoms of MG, one should be aware that MG can flare or return even after long periods. And I don't say this at the outset to patients to scare them because we're always aiming for a remission, but just to be aware that, if, that symptoms can come back after a period of time. It is a chronic disease. As I mentioned, most patients will need some form of treatment. Uh, we lump this into symptomatic treatment that helps control the, the symptoms, may, maybe uh, minutes uh, to minute or hour to hour. And then we use what's called disease modifying therapies. All the therapies Dr. Gange mentioned are work on the immune system. And we have a number of other medications Dr. Siddiqui also introduced that are a bit older that we also use to control the immune system. And then you've heard about surgical treatments, removing of the thymus gland uh, over 100 years ago was shown to be beneficial and we still use this. There's more evidence that this does help in myasthenia. So this is part of the treatments. The goals of the treatment are always remission, as I mentioned, uh, ideally even uh, perhaps uh, being a prolonged remission or what we call minimal manifestation. So really some sort of symptoms, but there's little interference with daily functioning. Every patient with MG is different, and I know that that's said often about different uh, diseases, but uh, I, this is really particularly the case in myasthenia because there's quite this fluctuating and variable nature to the condition um, that can be unpredictable at times, which is one reason uh, many of us in neuromuscular disease, Dr. Gange, Dr. Siddiqui, and I like treating myasthenia because we can actually make a big difference on patients' lives, but it also does require us to be very vigilant um, to pay attention if patients were to worsen. We're always uh, aware if someone's having a minor uh, flare-up to see if we need to modify the medications. And uh, from the patient side, this does require re regular medical checkups for the most part, unless someone really has been symptom-free for a long time, and perhaps this can be done less frequently. And I should also mention, although most of our testing, uh, Dr. Siddiqui mentioned some of the biomarkers are good at diagnosis, I would agree with his statement that these are not often that useful at predicting how someone will do um, or how even how someone is doing. We don't do the electrical tests and the blood tests. It's not like diabetes where you get to see how your diabetes is doing by measuring the blood sugar or even some of these electrical tests. So really the medical assessments are still the most useful. It's important to check in with your doctor now, how someone does that um, varies. Uh, and now during the pandemic, you, you'll know that many of us are doing virtual care. It's changed again, uh, where we're often having to use some of our measures, outcome measures, uh, asking patients questions on how they're doing. And also ideally, if possible, inter introducing some of the assessments in person where we check someone's strength and, uh, uh, and assessments throughout the body. And another general concept is, while we're doing all this, the goal of treatment is not only to keep someone from functioning and feeling well, but also to prevent damage to the muscle. Dr. Siddiqui showed this uh, diagram here. You can see the nice folds with a lot of the receptors on the end here. And over time, uh, what can happen if there is multiple attacks or uncontrolled myasthenia, this flattening of the muscle membrane can occur, which can uh, become fixed over time. So that's what we're trying to prevent and that's why we urge uh, patients with myasthenia to check in frequently with their physicians uh, to make sure that that's happening. The, the difference between other muscular dystrophies, uh, in my mind, myasthenia gravis is not a neurodegenerative disease because we do have these treatments. It can, uh, uh, there can be fixed weakness that develops where our goal is always to prevent that. And the other reason it's, it's somewhat different than most uh, muscular dystrophies or other muscle diseases is that a lot of this problem that you see here happens primarily at what's called the junction, the con connection between the nerve and muscles, not throughout the whole muscle. And also that these junctions have a lot of reserve in order to, to maintain strength 
uh, and that's built in. So it's, uh, that also affects the fairly um, favorable disease course. Let's talk about fatigue a little bit. Certainly this is an important concept in myasthenia. This is a, a study at the top left here that uh, my colleague, Dr. Barnett Tapia, who works with me in the clinic, uh, developed uh, looking at different major themes related to myasthenia and of course, in how severe or impaired someone was in all these different aspects that Dr. Siddiqui mentioned was important. But the other concept that came through is this concept of fatigability. So certainly this is a key, and this is not something only that physicians have observed over the decades. This is a data collected from patient interviews. So, and this is recent, 2014. So in this day and age, it's still the case that this fatigability that we have known about is one of the most important things to patients. And overall, that leads to overall impairment in all these different sub-themes or uh, parts of the body that deal with the muscles. So certainly this fatigability is a hallmark. And what we're really referring to there is a fatigability of muscle contraction. So the ability to maintain a muscle contraction is not uh, possible as well in myasthenia due to the um, concepts that Dr. Siddiqui mentioned. And it's important to distinguish that Fatigability from fatigue, which is a bit more nonspecific. If you look it up in the dictionary, there's a number of different terms for it, tiredness, weariness, lassitude, but these are all getting at uh, a more nonspecific uh, term that may not be the fatigability of muscle contraction that we look for, but it still could be an important MG, and I wouldn't discount it altogether. This is a study uh, that we did uh, a few couple of years ago showing that just asking that question about fatigue in general still can have benefit and use in measuring myasthenia. But it's important to recognize that there can be other causes for it. Depression, mental issues, medical issues such as thyroid, vitamin deficiency, uh, et cetera, and other neurological, neuromuscular conditions as well. Here's the different uh, muscle groups, as I mentioned. Here's a different, a number of different ways of looking at fatigability. As you can, as you've heard, this can happen second to millisecond to millisecond, over seconds to minutes throughout the day, or even, uh, more broadly in terms of seasons. Now here's uh, the concepts of how sleep and sleepiness is introduced. And, and this is part of actually a grant that Muscular Dystrophy Canada, as I mentioned, was able to support. And we've collaborated with sleep and respiratory colleagues at U of T to develop strategies and concepts that we've got borrowed from other conditions, um, muscular dystrophies, ALS, where similar patterns of breathing occur. And our goal is to look at both pediatrics and adults and to comprehensively studying how breathing, breathing problems at night during sleep across the age spectrum affects people, and not just in people that are uh, having an acute crisis or flare-up, but just in general. So how do we measure breathing? So here's a few concepts. We can use some questions. Uh, it's quite limited in our myasthenic scales, actually, the different questions that we use. We sometimes borrow other scales that are used to assess breathing. And, and uh, one of our goals in this project is to see what of the, which ones of these questions might be most valid, simply over the phone or in person. And some of the tests that we use in the clinic are volume tests, so how much strength someone has uh, in producing a volume of breathing, and also how strong. So what are the pressures? So one is uh, maximal inspiratory pressure. You can see the device in the bottom left here with a mouthpiece. But as you might expect in myasthenia and other conditions, mouth weakness can often be a factor. So uh, there's a sniff test that can be done through the nose that might mitigate that. And this is some of the things we're investigating now through this grant. It's also important to note that sometimes we do this, these tests seated or flat, flat being a little more tough. So we're also exploring what, which one of these tests are, are best in MG. What about sleep disordered breathing? So that's another way that we might be able to tease out uh, breathing difficulties because at night is when some breathing problems may come out. And it was known for a number of years now through Dr. Mike Nicole's work in London that sleep apnea or a, a problem uh, that occurs where breathing stops and starts during sleeps is common in myasthenia. And the first publication from our grant here has just come out a few weeks ago that does show that this can also occur in children. The good news is that this can be treated with a device that applies pressure to support breathing. What about sleepiness? Well, and why is this all important? Well, if you don't breathe well at night, this can lead to sleepiness in the day. And this is a study that we did a few years ago where we showed this. Uh, in fact, in myasthenia, that excessive daytime sleepiness is common. It can also occur when myasthenia is stable and it can be difficult to detect. So we did these sleepiness tests where people take naps 
And we were able to show that this does occur in myasthenia. And it's most often related to sleep apnea, as we might expect. We did a polycytography test or a sleep test at night. So what can we do about it? We showed through a follow-up study that napping can actually be helped because these here are naps. And we've shown that patients with myasthenia weakness, uh, the weakness itself can be mitigated by getting uh, some naps in. That's not always easy. So here's some practical suggestions from this. Firstly is always try to get a good night's sleep. If you're still difficult or tired after this or your myasthenia is active, talk to your doctor. And napping can not only help sleepiness, but can also help weakness, especially the eyes based on our study, if you can manage it. So just to conclude, uh, course of MG is variable. It can depend on the kind of myasthenia, the treatments given to control the disease. I think a lot of exciting um, uh, trials coming up that might change the course of myasthenia once again over the next few de decades. And the best way really to monitor this is to check with your doctor uh, to monitor the signs and symptoms of MG intermittently to ensure that you're not going into a crisis and also to make sure you're optimized. Fatigability of muscle contraction I showed you is a hallmark of MG, but you have to be cautious just attributing generalized fatigue that could be due to other causes to myasthenia. There are validated questions and techniques. I showed you some of these devices that we might use and some, including sleep studies, if appropriate. I'm not advocating this for everyone, but check with your doctor if that's appropriate uh, that can measure breathing dysfunction. And I think this is something that was known for years that sleep is important for general health and for muscle health and for MG. And some of our work confirmed that. And if you're not able to get restful sleep, sleep I would suggest try naps if you can and seek medical opinion because it may be over and above uh, something you're able to notice at night. And respiratory support can be helpful if that's the case. With that, I'll conclude and stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Katzberg. That was excellent. Um, next, we have time for a live Q&A. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them in, into the chat box. I know some of you went ahead and emailed us your questions ahead of time, so we'll go ahead and start with those first. Um, this individual uh, emailed to say, I was recently diagnosed with myasthenia gravis. Is there a particular diet I should follow or any evidence on what foods to avoid? Dr. Katzberg, do you have any suggestions or information on this topic? Sure, uh, this is a common uh, question. Uh, I think uh, one thing that's often talked about is the so-called um, low inflammatory diet. Uh, myasthenia gravis is known to be a, uh, a inflammatory condition. So sometimes people follow certain types of diets with foods that are known to have low inflammatory value. Nothing more specific than that. There's a number of these out there. That's one thing that people that use. Um, also, I would encourage people, this is a good opportunity to remind people to check with their doctors on medications that should be avoided and also other uh, vitamins and other supplements that one should be cautious about. One example is magnesium, for example, which uh, can make myasthenia worse. Not as much in the pill form, usually if it's given intravenous in high doses, but still uh, an important reminder to check about medications and supplements. Excellent, thank you. The next question is um, uh, a question we received about whether having occasional cigars while uh, dealing with myasthenia gravis is okay. Can I leave that to any of the panelists or should I ask Dr. Katzberg again? Do you have any uh, information on this? It's Hans Katzberg, nothing specific on this. You know, um, because breathing can be involved in myasthenia, we generally uh, tend to ask patients to avoid smoking uh, of any form. Uh, I think the occasional cigar may not be uh, as bad as daily smoking, for example, of any sort, but uh, I would still be cautious about uh, inhalation as that could be, uh, uh, make myasthenia, which can already have breathing difficulties, a bit worse through other right. mechanisms. Okay, and then there's a question about having more frequent, rapid, shallow breathing without, with any exertion indicates, does that indicate worsening MG? So frequent, rapid, shallow breathing with any exertion, does that indicate worsening MG? Okay, I'll do the final one because it's a breathing one. But uh, again, I think there can be a number of things that can cause rapid, shallow breathing, um, with, especially with exertion. So 
If it happens consistently, though, it perhaps could be a sign of uh, that myasthenia is, is having some, some problems. So I think if someone is worried about it, they should certainly check with their doctor. Excellent. Well, I'll just add to that is that uh, breathing with myasthenia, yeah, rapid shallow breathing, but if the breathing becomes more difficult when they lie down particularly, that suggests diaphragm weakness. And so we look for that carefully. If the patient has difficulty lying down and the breathing gets worse, so that's a little more specific sign. But again, that can be from other diseases as well. And as Dr. Katzberg mentioned, you need to see a physician anytime you have breathing issues with myasthenia in board, on board. Yeah. Excellent. Um, there was this question that came in about whether there's a patient registry for myasthenia gravis. They specifically asked about MDC, but also uh, across Canada. So I can speak for MDC. We do, when you do register as a client with Muscular Dystrophy Canada, we do ask for information about your diagnosis, and we do have information about different Can Canadians across coast to coast uh, with myasthenia gravis. Um, and then I am sure you'll all mention also the CNDR, which is the Canadian National Disease Registry for Neuromuscular Disorders. Um, also collects information on myasthenia gravis, um, individuals with myasthenia gravis. Uh, another question that came in is an individual is in their second trimester of pregnancy and has MG, and they're worried, does MG worsen during pregnancy, typically worsen or lead to challenges with labor? Dr. Genj, can I ask you to speak on this one? I need to be unmuted. Am I good? Okay. Um, well, there is, that's a great question. Um, in fact, it has a 333 rule. Some patients get worse, some patients get better, and some patients stay the same. So myasthenia can worsen during pregnancy, and, and it's actually one of the things that will cause an exacerbation. The most important thing for, from my perspective is to make sure that you are with an obstetrician who's, who is um, a, uh, someone who is knowledgeable about um, autoimmune disease in pregnancy. That's probably the most important thing you can do. Obviously, um, the obstetrician and the neurologist stay in close touch during a pregnancy. And if you get any symptoms, uh, everyone is fatigued when they're pregnant and they're particularly fatigued right after, but there is a difference in the quality of the tiredness uh, between myasthenia and normal uh, postpartum uh, fatigue from having a baby who doesn't sleep. Um, so I think the most important thing I recommend to everyone is to be with an obstetrician that is, is knowledgeable in autoimmune disease. We, we tend to call them high risk obstetricians. That doesn't mean you're high risk, but it just uh, denotes that their experience with, uh, with uh, women uh, with, neurologic, uh, with neurologic or other conditions that require closer monitoring. That's excellent. Just being mindful of time, if we haven't uh, um, got to your question, I will uh, email via, via the research at muscle.ca or you can send us an email as well. I know Dr. Genj mentioned this today um, in terms of collecting evidence or information to help support new treatments to come into the Canada and to have it funded. We currently have a study at Muscular Dystrophy Canada where we're looking at the economic cost impact or the impact of neuromuscular disorders. So the cost of living with neuromuscular disorders, the impact on your quality of life. And we encourage Canadians with uh, myasthenia gravis and their family members to take this survey. It's on oursurvey.ca backslash MDC. And just to close, I'd like to thank all of our speakers uh, for sharing their insights and to our mission team at Muscular Dystrophy Canada for their ongoing work with supporting individuals with neuromuscular uh, disorders. I'd also like to thank Alexion Pharmaceuticals for helping to support such education initiatives and for their ongoing collaboration with MDC. I will post top five key learnings from today's webinar by the end of the week. And as always, I encourage you to please email your questions to research at muscle.ca. Thank you for your time and thank you again to our speakers.